All righty. Let's, uh, let's come back to task, please, and our discussion of empathy. No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, so um, in our discussion of empathy, and we kind of touched on this earlier in the day when we said, um, you know, part of it is making sure our own empathy is fully activated. So making sure that we understand enough and we have enough knowledge and we have enough perspective taking for uh, to have empathy ourselves. But then the other issue is our ability to teach empathy and convey that empathy and encourage that empathy in either the other staff that we work with, our paraprofessionals, or our students themselves. And I think that's also a big challenge. And a number of you talked about wanting to kind of take that and convey that to the people that you work with as well. So I did pull in some, um, some research by one of the leading empathy researchers, which is Dr. Karen Gordon. Um, and, and, and this research in particular deals with sort of building an empathic classroom. So building a classroom in which empathy is encouraged and fostered and taught. And of course, a lot of this boils down to leading by example. So for younger kids in, in elementary classrooms, primary classrooms, being able to model and demonstrate um, empathy. And one of her strategies, her first suggestion, she calls fill their bucket. And many of you as school counselors or, or other uh, uh, staff who work with kids in counseling environments might recognize this. So the idea of fill their bucket is demonstrating individually, one-on-one, -on -one, to those students, all of them in the classroom, your empathy for them, your connection to them, your reinforcement of them. And by experiencing that themselves, they learn it. And they learn what it feels like, and they learn how to do it. Seeking to understand. And so this is, this is where, as staff and as adults in those classrooms, we don't just observe the behavior, we don't just um, address the behavior, but we seek to understand the behavior. Those of us who have specific behavioral training will think about this as what? We'll refer to this as, as the what of behavior. The function, right? We want to know, we want to understand it, we want to know what's driving it, what role it's filling uh, for those kids. Um, and asking not telling. So we have a tendency as adults to tell kids that they're angry. You're really angry right now, you need to calm down. <laughs> or you're very upset. So we need to work on not telling kids how they feel, but asking, him how, asking them how they feel so that we can gather the information we need in order to show our empathy and teach the empathy to them. There are also a, really, a, a lot of really nice strategies um, that are available both, in, there are books uh, on teaching empathy in classrooms and, and raising uh, uh, kids with empathy, um, but there are a lot of nice resources online too um, that give you specific exercises for practicing perspective taking with kids. And I think that can be really valuable because it teaches them as peers to be able to take each other's perspective. Um, and then the other recommendation that Dr. Karen Gordon gives is within a classroom setting, creating what she calls a thankfulness environment, where there is a frequent thought about and expression of not only the things that bother you about other people, but the things that you appreciate about the people around you, the things that they catch them being good, things you did that pleased me, those kinds of ideas. And this last one is kind of tricky, um, because when you have a student in a classroom who has a particular issue, um, sometimes it can be helpful to educate peers about the issue, but that's rife with all sorts of privacy problems, isn't it? So for example, um, when my middle son came into our home and he was going to be placed with, with us and we knew in advance. Um, that he had a diagnosis of Asperger's and we had been able to observe how that played out for him. Um, we uh, made the decision as parents to talk to his teacher and ask if it would be okay if we provided some information to his class, very small class, about that. And we did. We weren't sure exactly how that would go, but it went very well. So what it did is it sort of set the stage to help his, he was second grade? at the time, third grade. So we did it in a very developmentally appropriate way and it set the stage for them to understand him 
and his little quirks in a way that I'm not sure they otherwise, otherwise would have. And as a result, they have been very accepting and they have been very understanding of why those things play out the way that they do for him. But again, that's a tricky one to do. Do you guys have some thoughts about that? I, I, I think it's really necessary. And with, with high school kids, you can ask them. Like I can think of a kid we had a few years ago with Tourette's. Mm -hmm. Well, Tourette's can be pretty distracting and pretty weird to, to people who don't understand it. So this kid at the beginning of every semester would leave the room, have me come in and tell the whole class what this looked like. And the kids, the kids rise to the occasion, and yep. as soon as they know, they're perfectly okay with it. And, and I think that most often that's the case. You know, kids will really rise to the responsibility a lot of times that you give them. Um, we had a child a few years ago um, who had a lot of trouble with um, constipation with incapricis and overflow incontinence. You know what that is? Kids who poop their pants. Um, it's a medical condition and it is a direct result of chronic constipation that causes um, nerve endings, uh, tissues to stretch and dilate in a way that doesn't give kids any advance warning um, that they have to have a bowel movement so it just sort of leaks out at different points. And as you can imagine, that's extremely socially impairing <laughs> to, to kids in a classroom setting. Um, it, uh, kids notice it, they notice the smell, they notice, and so um, we had a kiddo who struggled with this because the problem is that once it's a medical issue and a behavioral issue a little bit, but it's only a behavioral issue because kids have to learn different toileting habits while their bodies are healing. Um, and so they have to go to the bathroom more frequently and they have to do things like that. But, but largely it's just a medical issue. But the problem is it can take six months to a year um, for things to return to normal. Um, and that's six months to a year <laughs> of not being constipated. <laughs> You know, so if kids get constipated again and, you know, they, anyway. So, ki so kids will sometimes deal with this for a long time. So we were working with this kiddo and his family and, and we, 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 he was experiencing a lot of negative feedback at school, a lot of social consequences. So we talked to them and we said, we talked to him first and we said, do you think it would help if your, if your classmate understood what's going on, that this is a medical thing, it's not something you can help, it's something a lot of kids deal with and we just gave them some information to normalize it. He really thought it would help, so then we talked to his parents and we said, here's what we would do, here's what it would look like. We will only do this if you're comfortable with it. We would get a release. You would decide exactly what we say and how we present it. They were absolutely on board. Then we talked to the teacher and we said, here's what we would like to talk to your class about. Here's the reason for it. Here's what it would look like. In this particular situation, everybody was completely on board, so we did. Myself and a colleague, we went into the classroom. We had designed a peppy little presentation. Um, that explained to these kids why this happened, um, that it was very common, it wasn't his fault, and it, it wiped out really almost all of the negative um, social response for him. His, his, his class became, it, it, they started to show empathy because, because one of the things we talked about is what would it, how would it feel to have this happen to you? You're sitting in the middle of math class. And, and when we were able to activate that for them, their treatment of him completely changed. You can't always do it though. But so I have to agree that in the instance where uh, we get a student, we know ahead of time that there's a condition, and the parents either come in and educate the class or allow us to do it, they're more accepting. But when a, a child shows up and has differences, differences noticeable differences, mm -hmm. and we can't explain to the class or anybody else about what's happening, they're not accepted. Right. And right. it's very difficult for those kids and for the teacher. 